This is Global Tennessee, news analysis and commentary from the Tennessee World Affairs Council in Nashville. Global Tennessee is produced in association with the Center for International Business at Belmont University and the International Business Council of the Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce. The World Affairs Council is a nonpartisan, nonprofit educational association, and the views expressed on Global Tennessee are those of the participants. Welcome to Global Engagement. I'm Patrick Ryan. This is a Tennessee World Affairs Council Global Affairs Awareness Project that connects you with current events. Uh, we're starting this during the stay at home period of the pandemic response, especially as students are working from home and can find this conversation useful in knowing the world. Each week we'll share five important topics from the news and provide background context and analysis. And we'll get you involved with through the uh, webinars interactive features as this is a, a live program. We'll also uh, uh, post these uh, in the archives. The global engagement will be broadcast live every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Central Time as a webinar on Zoom where you can participate with your questions and comments. The series will be archived by video on the Tennessee World Affairs Council's YouTube channel and by audio on the Global Tennessee podcast. You can find links to all of the episodes on our website, tnwac.org. And don't forget the teleconferences we offer several times a month where you can question global movers and shakers. There's one tomorrow featuring Muhammad Ali Abdullah, the political advisor to the Prime Minister of Libya. Lastly, make sure you're on the newsletter list. You can sign up on the tnwac.org homepage. That's how you can keep up with everything that's going on. Let me introduce my co-host for Global Engagement, Ambassador Dick Bowers. He retired after a distinguished career in the US Foreign Service with postings around the world, including as ambassador of the, the United States to Bolivia. He has continued his service work in the community, including service as the Rotary District Governor, leading Rotary clubs in half the state of Tennessee. He stays, stays uh, busy with ESL, uh, teaching English as a second language to new Americans and making regular mission trips to improve the lives of Hondurans. Ambassador Bowers has served on the World Affairs Council Board of Directors for eight years. I'll mention that uh, I spent 26 years in the Navy as a submariner and as an intelligence officer. I've always enjoyed talking about what's going on in the world, which led to the founding of the Tennessee World Affairs Council. So let's get started. Dick? Well, thanks, Pat. Good to be with you again. And uh, I'd like to add my welcome to this new program. And it's really cool that we can use this new technology like Zoom to pivot from what we were doing in the past in the face-by-face -face world. And now we can talk to each other in the virtual world. Uh, I'd like to make you aware of a couple other programs that Pat mentioned, like besides global engagement, which Pat and I will try to pull off every week for a half hour or 45 minutes or so on Tuesdays. Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. Central every week, there will be either a Global Nashville with Carl Dean program or a Global Dialogue, which is our Distinguished Speakers program. And they will be interactive in the sense that you'll be able to ask questions and engage the speakers if you wish. So this week, there's going to be the Global Nashville with Carl Dean, and he's going to be introducing or interviewing, excuse me, Ralph Schultz, who is the Nashville Chamber of Commerce head. It is going to be recorded this evening and will probably be broadcast tomorrow. Future episodes will also be live. So check the Tennessee World Affairs Council website for details, tnwac.org. Okay, now let's go on to the news, Pat. What are we gonna talk about this week? Thanks, Dick. Uh, today, we're going to drill down on uh, five topics in the news and provide uh, some background and uh, commentary. Uh, we'll start with uh, the COVID-19 topic, uh, which is uh, obviously dominating the news, and we'll, uh, we'll take a spin around the, uh, the globe and, and see what's happening in various countries uh, related to the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, then we're going to talk about the U.S. role in international organizations, some of which uh, is affecting the response to the pandemic, but uh, some of these organizations have uh, broader functions that the United States is involved in. Our third topic will be Iraq. What's going on in the political scene in Iraq? A new uh, prime minister. And uh, as you know, we have uh, troops in Iraq. So it's always an important uh, area of the world to keep up with. And Iraq is kind of a pivotal uh, country there. 
the fourth topic is uh, what's going on with the USS Theodore Roosevelt and COVID. Uh, this has uh, been in the news lately. The uh, commanding officer was uh, relieved by the acting secretary of the Navy, and we'll get into uh, what's happening there. But more importantly than the uh, the story, or maybe as importantly, is uh, the role of uh, uh, the Navy and, and these large strategic uh, assets in the national security posture of the United States. So we'll talk about that a little bit. And lastly, we'll talk about the global economy and the environment. Uh, after we get through the pandemic and are looking at uh, rebuilding the, uh, the damage that was done uh, to the economy, the global economy, uh, what will be the impact on the climate and the uh, Paris Accords. So that's it for uh, our, our top five topics. Uh, Dick, do you want to uh, jump into uh, topic one, the COVID-19 update? Uh, okay, I'll do that. But that's quite an ambitious uh, agenda, Pat. So I hope we can get through that. We'll have to talk fast and talk cogently. Well, so, our, our, our sponsors may cut us off it after a while, but we'll, <laughs> we'll press on. Okay. So what's been going on in the world? I think one of the big things that was playing out uh, outside the United States was the fact that the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson was admitted to the hospital, put in intensive care because of COVID-19, but he's out of that and he's out of the hospital and he's now back recuperating in checkers. Uh, he's not really all back to running the government in England and or in the UK right now, but I, most folks I think expect that to happen soon. In uh, Mexico, an interesting little tidbit. There was a public hospital where the nurses were asked not to wear their masks because they might scare the patients. I think I'd be more scared to see a nurse without a mask than I would with one, but yeah. different country. Crazy Spain and country. Austria, uh, the different countries in the different parts of the world are playing around with how do you get back to, the, to normalcy? When can you go back to work? Who goes back to work? How well do they go back to work? Do they still maintain social distancing? Do they only work half time? What's going on? But anyway, Spain and Austria had partial returns to work. Uh, Britain, France, and India did not and extended their, their lockdowns. As we all know here in Tennessee, the governors extended the lockdown. So we'll see what happens. Moscow, you don't hear a lot from Moscow. They're not saying a heck of a lot. But uh, one of the stories that came out talked about how they might run out of hospital beds in the next week or two. Total cases have surpassed 20,000 in, in Russia. So uh, we've got a lot of stuff going on. What else did you find out, Pat? Well, the, uh, in, in the, the news has been a couple of more tidbits, and we'll get into some deeper conversation. But um, uh, I saw that uh, Brazil is, is looking like they're going to have 12 times more cases than officially reported. And, and President Bolsonaro has been one of those leaders who has not aggressively dealt with the pandemic. So they may, uh, they may be paying the price there. Uh, in Southeast Asia, the leaders uh, in the, uh, the bloc of nations there in that region have uh, committed to fight together uh, against what they call the, quote, gravest public health crisis uh, in 100 years uh, to make the, uh, the region safe again. So they're, they're banding together. And, so, who, so what, who are we banding together with? Well, we're uh, we're talking <laughs> to people, but I don't think we've officially uh, put our, uh, uh, our our stock in with with anybody in particular. Yeah. Uh, in Iran, the death toll was approaching 4,700, and as we mentioned in the last global engagement, Iran is uh, one of the epicenters of of the pandemic spread. Uh, it uh, uh, spread throughout the Middle East as a result of pilgrims. Who had uh, who had uh, uh, been infected in the holy city of Hong Kong, Q O M? Uh, they were there for pilgrimages and then spread out uh, uh, there uh, of this the Shia sect and were uh, in Iran for pilgrimages. So it's it's really been uh, spread out uh, throughout the region. Isn't isn't there a lot of speculation that the Iranians are underreporting? Yeah. Yeah. What so. Do you think? Um, no, no telling what the number is, but 4,700 does sound low given uh, the impact that uh, Iran has had. And yeah. it, you, if you look at the uh, the leadership, a number of uh, ministers and senior uh, military officials in Iran have been infected uh, with the, the COVID-19 virus. So uh, like uh, people suspect, China has been underreporting and some other countries. 
And then there are countries that are reporting what they know, but they're not testing adequately, uh, like Brazil. So uh, the numbers are, are what they are, but uh, probably not as accurate as, as the reality. Uh, in the, uh, the world's economic uh, area, one of the uh, developments this week was an agreement between what's called the OPEC Plus, uh, OPEC, as you know, is a, a group of uh, countries. They're not all Middle Eastern countries, uh, but uh, they uh, they got together with non-OPEC countries, including uh, the United States. President Trump got in the, in the, involved in uh, the situation because the bottom has fallen out of the oil market. Uh, we were uh, seeing prices uh, down in the uh, the twenty dollar range, down from about uh, per 60, barrel per per barrel of oil, uh, down from about $60 or so. And that was a consequence of um, uh, an already oversupplied market uh, prior to the pandemic. But then the, uh, the pandemic hit and, and industrial production uh, slumped, uh, which meant that uh, energy supplies were not uh, required. So there was panic in the, uh, the oil market Although, uh, I don't know, Dick, if you've seen low prices, somebody told me they yeah. saw a, a dollar a gallon somewhere around Nashville here. I'd, well, I haven't, I'd, I haven't seen But I haven't been out that much, so I'm not seeing a lot of Well, oil. yeah, there, the, the, the tank of gas I've got in my car has gone a long way. There you go. So and I read, is, uh, go ahead. I read, Pat, that, that somebody was taking advantage of the fact that people haven't been driving on the roads very much and did a 72-hour New York to L.A. road trip. Wow. I mean, that was hitting 100, 120 miles an hour out there. What and evidently, mean? since nobody's out there driving, not too many of uh, Smokey the Bears out there could have to pull you over if you rolled along with yeah, that the, anyway. Cannonball run, was that Burt Reynolds? That's, there you that's go. back in time. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's not a lot of traffic out there. And a lot of insurance companies are, are giving rebates to uh, car insurance policies. Yeah. That's, so that's, if you didn't get a rebate, yeah. uh, be looking for it. But these countries got together because the, uh, the prices were just uh, – uh, especially countries that, that rely on the oil production, uh, like Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and, and some others, uh, they, they really uh, needed to, uh, to stem the, the price drop. Uh, although Saudi Arabia did increase their production um, to try to drive uh, uh, their market share up, uh, but uh, it, it didn't uh, really prove to be satisfying to the, the group. So they, they all got together and came to the conclusion that as a, as a joint agreement, they were going to drop almost 20 million barrels a day uh, from the daily production to try to get uh, supply back to where uh, demand is. So that's, uh, that's a fix in, uh, in the oil patch. But let, me, uh, let me ask a question about what was the United States' involvement with Mexico in this? Well, the, the United States was involved in the whole uh, negotiation because the, uh, the Saudis and the Russians were being uh, were seen as uh, trying to uh, kill the American shale oil market. Um, years, you know, some years ago, we were still net importers. And then right. uh, the discovery of fracking and some other uh, new methods to exploit oil fields that uh, previously had been unproductive. Uh, we were able to pump oil out of places where we couldn't before. So the U.S. market share was up. Uh, we were uh, uh, a net exporter at that point. We weren't completely self-reliant because there were certain qualities of crude oil that we required that we still needed to import. But uh, we were definitely in a better position than before. So this whole oil flap was seen as a way to drive the U.S. shale market uh, into the ground, pardon the pun. Um, hmm. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's let's move on Definitely. a little bit, Dick. We got a lot to cover here. All right. Uh, one more thing in the, um, or a couple more things in the, the category of uh, the COVID update. Uh, there are people who are concerned about the uh, implications of the pandemic on religious holidays and observances, especially in the Muslim world. Uh, coming up on April 23rd through May 23rd is the holy month of Ramadan in the Islamic faith. Uh, there are some countries like Indonesia that are concerned that uh, people may return from the big cities to their home villages during Ramadan and provide uh, vectors for uh, the pandemic to spread from uh, one place to another. So they're concerned about uh, stemming the uh, the travel of, of people in, in yeah. places like that. Uh, also uh, coming up in uh, July is the Hajj, which is the uh, annual pilgrimage in the, in the Muslim faith uh, to Mecca. Uh, it's required as one of the tenets of the Islamic faith that uh, each Muslim in their lifetime uh, make the Hajj at least once. 
And Saudi Arabia, uh, during the Hajj, hosts up to 3 million pilgrims performing the Hajj. And they've uh, built an extensive industry and infrastructure uh, to deal with that. But they're concerned, obviously, 3 million people assembling at the same place at the same time, uh, the, uh, the complications from the pandemic. Uh, even through July, uh, could be uh, astounding. Yeah, they don't. They don't just assemble. They they mass into the square right around the Kaaba. Right. So you're very very close to with everybody else during that. Yeah. 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 No, there's wow. uh, there's no social distancing at the Hajj. So uh, some officials are are sounding off that uh, they may uh, try to uh, put off uh, the pilgrims uh, coming in the numbers that they they normally would. You know, last week we mentioned briefly about uh, what was going on in Hungary and how certain political leaders, especially in Hungary, Viktor Orban, is taking advantage of COVID-19 to sort of yeah. push his partisan political agenda. Well, the same thing seems to be going on in India, where Prime Minister Modi, who is a Mus uh, Hindu, and his party is all kind of right-wing Hindu, has an anti-Muslim spin to it for quite some time. And now... They have accused the Muslims of being the vector by which this spreads. So Hindu nationalism is being ginned up to go after the Muslim minority in India. Of, it's a minority of millions of people, of course. Um, and young Muslim men who were passing food to the poor were assaulted with clubs and brick bat or cricket bats because it's a, cricket's a big sport there. Other Muslims have been beaten up several lynched and run out of the neighborhoods and attacked in mosques. So this is another example of where autocratic rulers will take advantage of a crisis going on that people are fearful of and point the finger at the wrong one. I keep hearing my president use the word Chinese virus from time to time. I'm really unhappy about the fact that he's saying this because all it does is raise the specter of racism that I don't think needs to be raised. Yeah. Well, the uh, the World Health Organization, when they named this particular pandemic COVID-19, they specifically said that uh, they wanted to avoid labeling any one place with uh, the name of, of the pandemic. All right. So uh, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, China and the supply chain. Uh, cool. there's, uh, there's a terrific uh, report by the Congressional Research Service, and especially for the students, I'll, I'll recommend that they uh, uh, take a note to uh, take a look at crs.congress.gov. That's the Congressional Research Service. There are analysts there who produce uh, reports for the Congress, uh, but they're available to the public. And there was one uh, the other day called COVID-19, China Medical Supply Chains and Broader Trade Issues. Uh, it's an excellent report by the Congressional Research Service. And the, uh, the gist of it is that uh, the outbreak of COVID-19, first in China, uh, and then globally, including the United States, has been drawing attention to the ways in which the U.S. economy depends on the manufacturing and supply chains uh, based in China. So it's been a particular concern to Congress uh, in the last month. And I know, uh, I think I mentioned last week that uh, we saw a tweet from the Republican uh, leader in Congress that there would be uh, a committee work done to look at uh, the supply chains and, and tighten up uh, where we were vulnerable. So take a look at the, that report from the Congressional Research Service. It's called COVID-19, China Medical Supply Chains and Broader Trade Issues. Dick, what's you know, next? Well, I, I would just uh, second your call to go to the Congressional Research. Those are, these are real quality papers dealing with real facts. They're nonpartisan. Uh, sometimes what they put in there is not, not necessarily liked by various people on one side or the other of the aisle, but uh, it's an excellent source for information. And you can go there and kind of pick your topic and go and see what you want to talk about. So let's move on to our second topic since we're, time is running fast. U.S. role in international organizations. When the Second World War ended, and actually before, the United States started planning for all right, what's going to happen after the Second World War. And we were convinced after being kind of burned twice for the First World War and the Second World War, we didn't want to get involved. We have to get involved in the world. And we have to create institutions that serve our interests, but also serve the interests of other countries in the world. And so out of those 
desires to make the world a more inter interactive uh, place, you've got the United Nations, you've got the World Health Organization, you've got the UN Children's Fund, you've got the World Food Program, you've got all these kinds of things going on. Now, these, some of them have been under attack recently, in particular, President Trump decided to take, take on the World Health Organization, who he said, quote, missed the call, as if they didn't sound the alarm fast enough, but the facts are that they did. Back in January, they were talking about the fact that the world is heading toward a pandemic, and, and we better get our act together and, and do what we can do. So the United States, for most of my lifetime, has been the primary supporter of all of these international organizations. And the fact that we are no longer pushing as that much as we should um, is not a good thing for the future, in my opinion. So Trump is, is threatening to cut the WHO budget if they don't sort of say things the way he wants them said, which is not the way you do science. The WHO is a scientific organization will tell things like they see them. Anyway, NATO, UN, World Bank, IMF, all of these things are institutions that are going to be shaken to the core as a result of this pandemic of, of that's going on right now. And we're going to have to decide how do we want to engage with the rest of the world. I am convinced the future of the United States is not brightest by building big walls and going our own. That's 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 true. Uh, I think uh, after the pandemic, whatever the new normal is, uh, there's going to be a, a, a deep dive into what America's role in the world is, a reassessment of globalization. Uh, on the whole, globalization has, has been uh, uh, positive uh, in tra terms of trade and, and uh, uh, people doing things uh, that uh, they couldn't do uh, on their own as as individual countries um the uh the supply chains when they were working were very efficient and increased uh, productivity uh, around the world but there's going to have to be a, a real hard look at uh at what globalization means to the united states and there's uh there were rumblings about uh globalization and and the uh, the negative sides of it uh, prior to the pandemic so this is just going to accelerate uh, all of that you know, one of, one of the things that struck my attention this week was uh, the, the fact that the, in North Dakota, this huge processing plant for pork, um, and the COVID-19 hit it, and so they're shutting it down. Smithfield is the name of, this, of the firm. Right. Smithfield, Smithfield was bought by a Chinese firm about six years ago. So it is wholly owned by China, a Chinese firm. And... They bought it because they wanted to increase the supply of pork for their population because China is not food sufficient. It must import food to feed those millions of people there. Sure. Uh, interestingly enough, I've seen no comment about the fact that that Smithfield enterprise and plant are owned by the Chinese only that COVID was there. And we may, Americans may be facing a shortage of pork products as a result of them shutting down. Well, food but, insecurity is an issue for uh, quite, a, quite a few nations. And uh, places like Saudi Arabia have been criticized for uh, buying land in, in places like the Horn of Africa. Chinese have done it too in Brazil yeah. and various other places. But interestingly, like Chinese have a food security policy. I don't know that we have a food security policy. Do you? Um, no, I've never heard of it. And there may be uh, documents deep down in the bowels of the agriculture department, <laughs> but it's uh, it's not something that uh, that's right. We, we, th we think about much. We take we take our uh, food supply for granted and America's uh, agricultural abundance uh, for granted. But when um, you know people start talking about this or that product yeah. going going out of uh, availability people get uh, it, it gets your attention so let me but, let me change change the subject for a well, minute well one, one last thing little... one last oh. thing on uh, on the the globalization I, I i think it's it's also fair to say that despite any uh, any warts that uh, need to be examined in terms of globalization it's not likely that uh, we're going to turn back the clock and be 
a totally self-sufficient or an uh, autarkic uh, society where we just uh, shed our connections around the world. Uh, I think uh, the fact that there, we are dealing with a pandemic that is a global pandemic, no matter where it started, it, you're not going to stop it uh, without cooperation among countries. And uh, global issues, that, whether it's global pandemics, uh, climate change, uh, the global commons, use of uh, the high seas, what, whatever um, thousands of things that we do jointly with other countries, it's, it's always going to remain a team sport. Yep, absolutely. So tell me about what's going on in Iraq. You spent a lot of time worrying about what's happening in the Middle East, and Iraq is doing something this week that they haven't done for a while, right? Well, they've they've been uh, stalled a little bit in uh, in their political process. They had a caretaker prime minister, but now we have a a, a new gentleman in place, Mustafa Al Kadimi. Uh, he's the new prime minister, and uh, Secretary of State Pompeo issued a statement of support on Monday. So the United States is is backing this guy. Uh, and why is why does it matter? Well, he's he's the third candidate to lead Iraq since the uh, uh, former Prime Minister uh, Ali Mahdi uh, resigned last year amid uh, uh, very large anti-government protests throughout the country, uh, targeting corruption and the lack of basic services in the country. Uh, Kadami is uh, formerly the intelligence chief of Iraq. Uh, he's not affiliated with any party, and he uh, currently has the support of most uh, major uh, political factions in, in the country. So he's got uh, time to assemble a new cabinet uh, supported by a majority of the uh, fractured parliament uh, that uh, previously served. For now, he appears to have solid support, and uh, it looks like he could be uh, the guy who uh, tries to put things back together. As you know, Iraq has faced uh, great difficulty uh, with uh, ISIS. Uh, the United States has troops deployed to Iraq uh, to fight ISIS. And you may recall that in January, we had a, a uh, an episode with uh, Iran and the Iran-backed militias in, uh, in Iraq um, who uh, were behind attacks against the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad. Um, that played out in uh, a series of back and forth uh, violent activities, including the killing of Qasem al Soleimani, who is uh, who was um, the general in charge of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. He was one of the most senior officials in the Iranian government, and he was killed by a U.S. missile attack near the Baghdad airport. Uh, that resulted in uh, a counterattack by Iran on US military forces in Northern Iraq, a series of uh, surface to surface uh, missile attacks against an air base where we had troops stationed, about uh, 12 very large uh, mm -hmm. ballistic missiles uh, that resulted in uh, injuries, uh, traumatic brain injuries to about 50 US service people. So that, uh, that signaled uh, again, once again, that Iraq was uh, kind of the, uh, the firing zone for uh, problems between Iran and uh, the United States. So well, we'll, see, cool. we'll see what happens with the new prime minister yeah. as far as trying to bring the pieces together. He seems to have been a solid guy and a survivor for quite some time. And as the former sure. head of the intelligence service, he obviously knows where things are buried and what's going on. So Right, right. And, well, and by, by the way, tomorrow, um, the Middle East Institute in Washington uh, will have a webinar on Iraq politics. So if you're interested in more details about what's happening with the new prime minister, uh, visit the Middle East Institute website and uh, sign up for their webinar. Uh, and, and that uh, leads me to uh, just another tip. If you go to uh, some of the think tank websites, uh, I'm thinking of the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, Brookings, the Kearney uh, Endowment for International Peace, uh, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, uh, all of these think tanks uh, put on webinars and programs. And now that we're in the pandemic uh, phase here, um, they're pretty much uh, all um, by Zoom and webinars that you can dial into. So uh, check out what's uh, what's available from think tanks and you can keep up um, be below the headline. You can get some details and listen to speakers that you wouldn't be able to access otherwise. Speaking of details, you're a, you're a Navy guy, retired Navy guy, submariner, and you served on surface ships as well, I understand, right? And yep. then you then you ended up your career as being an intel guy uh, telling 
the Pentagon what's really going on in the world. What's been going on with one of our premier aircraft carriers recently, Patrick? Well, this is uh, topic no number four, the uh, USS Theodore Roosevelt and uh, the COVID virus. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about what the national security implications are uh, of, uh, of the uh, epidemic, the pandemic uh, reaching uh, active uh, U.S. Uh, warships. And as uh, most of you know, the background on this story, the, the ship, uh, the Theodore Roosevelt, uh, is uh, one of the Navy's 10 uh, large deck aircraft carriers, nuclear powered, carries about 75 uh, aircraft on, on board and about 5,000 uh, crewmen. Uh, they were deployed in the Western Pacific, made a port call in Vietnam and Da Nang, uh, and uh, acquired uh, the COVID-19 uh, virus uh, that spread initially through a small number of crewmen, uh, but it was enough to alarm the, uh, the, the commanding officer, Captain Brett Crozier, uh, to uh, the possibility it would spread further. Uh, now you have to realize that on aircraft carriers and all Navy warships, um, the uh, the birthing compartments are are very tight spaces. Um, there's no there's no social distance distancing. You put five thousand people on a, a ship that big, and you know we we saw the uh, the problems with cruise ships. People in their cabins were uh, having their food delivered, and and they could. Uh, segregate themselves, but there's no segregation on an aircraft carrier. The birthing areas are large open spaces where uh, dozens and dozens of people are uh, crammed together in, in close quarters. So uh, the captain was uh, worried about the spread of COVID. Uh, the ship went to Guam where they offloaded some of the uh, uh, people who were infected, uh, launched uh, uh, tests to see how many others were uh, were infected. Uh, at some point, the captain uh, sent an email which leaked out talking about the condition of his crew. Uh, he was worried that uh, they might uh, see further spread of the virus. Uh, and the way that he uh, sent that email uh, was uh, upsetting to the acting secretary of the Navy who fired the captain. And then the secretary of the Navy flew to Guam and had a uh, uh, kind of a rant on the general announcing system uh, to the point where he was uh, forced to resign. Uh, so it's it's been kind of a, a uh, really rough episode for uh, the crew and, and for the Navy, the uh, leadership and the, the chain of command, how to deal with uh, the problem. So as of Sunday, 92% uh, of the, the ships, uh, almost 5,000 crew members have been tested uh, for COVID-19. There have been 585 positive results from the test, and more than 3,900 sailors wow. have been uh, moved ashore and entered 14-day uh, isolation uh, in hotels and other rooms across Guam, which, uh, as you know, is a, a U.S. territory in, in the Western Pacific. So the ship is, uh, is still in Guam. It's uh, been pulled out of its uh, active duty uh, role in the Western Pacific. Um, which uh, leads us to a, another aspect in the story, Dick. As, as you know, uh, aircraft carriers are uh, kind of the forward tip of the spear and uh, represent our deterrent um, conventional power in uh, far-flung parts of the world, and in this case, the Western Pacific. So uh, being in Guam with um, uh, 3,900 sailors off the ship and the, uh, the ship tied up in Guam, uh, they're not uh, patrolling the Western Pacific, uh, which has some people concerned about the deterrent effect of uh, the, the pandemic, what, what it's doing to our ability to project power. There's an interesting uh, article uh, that I'll uh, recommend by Michael O'Hanlon uh, from Brookings. Again, Michael O'Hanlon. Uh, so if you go to the Brookings website, you can find this article. It's called Why Crozier Was Correct. Uh, he talks about the specifics of the decision of the captain, what he did, but it also uh, talks about the uh, the Navy's ability to project power. Uh, he makes a couple of good points. One is that the Navy is only one element of uh, our our uh, deterrent power that we project uh, abroad, and that uh, the surge potential of Navy uh, aircraft carriers and other naval assets is more important than continuous presence. And he uses the example that um, during the mm. um, the war. Uh, with Iraq, we uh, we surged uh, the the first one, uh, Desert Storm. We surged aircraft carriers, so it wasn't that we have one aircraft carrier that uh, that is able to um, to sustain um, a a far flung 
combat operation, but we surge additional carriers. So Michael O'Hanlon uh, has an interesting uh, dissection of the case, uh, talks about the, the ship and about the Navy uh, uh, projecting power abroad. I know you were an Army guy, so you've, you, you probably, you probably <laughs> lived, lived in one of those barracks where you had, what, uh, 300 square feet of uh, living space or something? Oh, tell me about it, Pat. I, I, let's just remind you, I did spend one night aboard a submarine, and it was the worst night of my life because those bunks were so close. I, I couldn't roll over in the bunk because the top bunk was so close to me. And couldn't. I had to roll out and then roll back in. Anyway, um, one of the things I think for our student audience out there in my diplomatic career in the military, uh, if there's a diplomatic or political crisis around the world, one of the first questions that will be asked by the president is, where are my carriers? Because that's basically, as you say, Pat, the tip of the spear. And if we need to surge in to either evacuate people or to project force, it's the carriers that do that. Right. I think uh, the, the postscript of that whole episode is uh, the fact that the pandemic is not going away and the Navy is going to have to deal with uh, the possibility that uh, the coronavirus will get uh, to other ships. And the, uh, the first steps they've taken is that ships that are about to deploy, they quarantine the crew on the ship for 14 days before the ships depart. Oh, that goes. Wow. To make you know, sure it's that not just the Navy, Pat, because if you think about the guys sitting down, we still have Air Force people sitting in silos, ready to launch ballistic missiles if the need occurs. Right. They don't have much room among each other. They're they're in there together all the time. So it's yeah, a, it's but a you can problem. you can you can rotate the crews out. It's not like uh, well, that's you, true. You, you set sail for six months and and, uh, and you're out there. You go with what you got. Yeah, for sure. All right, topic five. Moving on. Yep. All right, so global economy and environment. Can we have both economic recovery and compliance with the Paris Accord? And an interesting factoid that came out this week is the Japanese prime minister said that Paris Accord is under threat if coronavirus trumps climate change. Now, it's interesting he used I the think, word uh, Dick, Trump's I think that was the, uh, the environment minister, uh, Shinjiro Kozumi. I'm sorry, you're absolutely right. It's the, it's, it's the environment minister. But he warned on Monday that the Paris Climate Accord could face death if steps to fight global warming were put on a back burner to facilitate the economic recovery from the coronavirus pandemic. It's, it's going to be a very complicated and interesting road as we go forward. How countries and states or cities decide to inch back into normality, it put people back to work, stop the social distancing because we now know it, maybe have a different variety of it. Um, and when we do go back to work, is the Paris Accord gonna be out there? Now the United States bailed out of the Paris Accords because President Trump didn't like it. Um, other countries, some, you know, almost 190 of them are still part of this effort but it's gonna to have to be renewed. And when we talk about the pandemic, the next big snowball that's coming our way is climate change. Right. And Tom Friedman, if you Google Tom Friedman in the New York Times, he talks about mother nature being an equal opportunity destroyer. Mother nature is physics and biology and it doesn't have spin and it doesn't have somebody telling you what they just think about stuff. So it's going to be an interesting time. And, and there's a New York Times article. If you Google the New York Times, March 27th, me and Christ, M-E-E-H-A-N, Christ, C-R-I-S-T. He's a writer in residence at Columbia University. And he's got an a article that's called What the Coronavirus Means for Climate Change. So one of the things that I know has happened, for example, when China shut down, the air quality got much better. I understand that the canals in Venice were cleared up because people were not going out and throwing junk in the canals. So around the world, because of the economic shutdown, climate is being given a little respite. When we ramp back up, what's going to happen? That well, that's that's a good question, and and now I'm I'm stuck with the metaphor in my mind, the big snowball coming our way. Thanks thanks for that. <laughs> well, it'll be in, in November, December when the snowball gets here. But anyway. uh, okay, I'm, and um, I'm also thinking of uh, which senator was that had the snowball on the floor of the Senate, and he said, "How yeah. how, how could we have global warming if it's it's snowing outside?" 
Well, yeah. we have, uh, Dick, we have 14 participants in the uh, attendee room here. And uh, maybe we can get somebody to uh, uh, chime in with a question or a comment. Uh, we see some familiar faces there. Um, use the chat function if you have a question and uh, we'll do our best to answer it. Um, so basically you click on that chat button and the window will open up and there's a place to type your message down at the bottom. And then you click, click on select and it will go up and be posted. So questions. We'll, we'll be happy to field uh, any sort of question about the five topics we covered today or the World Affairs Council, uh, the programs we have coming up. Just a reminder, uh, as, uh, as Ambassador Bowers mentioned, uh, we uh, have pivoted from our in-person programming. So we, uh, during the pandemic and into the uh, however distant future, we're uh, social distancing. We won't be doing uh, live in-person programs, but we will be doing these live webinars. Uh, this series, uh, Global Engagement with uh, Ambassador Bowers and I will be on every Tuesday at 2 p.m. And uh, you can uh, see that also um, in the archive on YouTube, uh, our YouTube channel where we have our collection of uh, videos. It's youtube.com slash TNWAC. And you can also, if you are a podcast listener and you like to uh, keep up with things uh, in your car or during your your run, if you uh, are getting out and uh, and staying uh, active um, with your, your podcast, you can catch our podcast, the Global Tennessee series of podcasts on soundcloud.com slash TNWAC. And uh, just a reminder, while we wait for somebody to uh, provide some commentary or uh, a question here uh, from our uh, listener room. Um, we, uh, we will be also doing every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Uh, either a Global National with Carl Dean, uh, where former Mayor Carl Dean talks to uh, leaders from the community. And that will be uh, opposite uh, each alternating week with a program called Global Dialogue. And I'll be talking with uh, distinguished visiting speakers who uh, we can now reach out to uh, from afar. We don't need to have them in our immediate presence, which gives us a little more latitude as far as inviting uh, people that uh, would not be able to, uh, to come to Nashville for just a single event. Well, uh, Dick, I don't see any questions. Uh, well, I see a questions. I got two questions, Pat. Oh, okay. Uh, so you're, one, you're, you're looking at the, I was looking at, at at the chat room, and, and we also have the Q and A uh, uh, function here. Kent Crossley, hey Kent, how you doing? He uh, he asks, how will we uh, pay for the virus expense? Um, <laughs> that's that's a uh, that's a good question, uh, Kent. I think uh, we're we're writing checks, and I know um, the the Congress has passed a. A two plus trillion dollar CARES Act, and the government is turning a fire hose of dollars onto um, businesses across the, the spectrum under the uh, PPP, the Payroll Protection Plan, uh, and several other small business administration and uh, large business um, uh, bailouts and and money to the uh, to Boeing and the airline industry. So you're right. It's a it's a good question. There's a lot of money being spent, and the the answer is, uh, you know, uh, how how do we bring down the deficit in good times? Is uh, through taxes and increased productivity. Uh, the economic uh, shortfall that we're seeing, uh, unemployment at record highs, and likely to continue to go up, especially here in Nashville where we rely. Uh, so much on the hospitality industry, uh, our local economy is is probably uh, more affected uh, as a percent of per capita um, than than many other places, given our reliance on the hospitality industry. So it's it's going to be a long road back after uh, the the pandemic is uh, uh, is over, uh, and that leads into a question from uh, someone who asked, uh, any thoughts on how or when we will return to normal? Uh, Dick, any uh, you have any plans to go to uh, hockey games in, in uh, October? I think a lot, a lot depends on what you mean by normal. Uh, the way that life was like, let's say, before Christmas last year, we will never return to that, I don't think. Uh, the world will have changed. 
how we do things, the relationships we have in the world are all going to be very different than, than what they are now. But to but end up on Pat's last question, the way we're going to pay for it is my grandchildren and their children and their children are going to be paying for this for a long, long, long time. Well, this is, this is a, a once in a century uh, event that uh, yeah, but the, is, is going to reshape not just the economy and, and the government's finances, we but a, a lot of the ways uh, that, uh, yeah. that we live and, and work. And uh, it's, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a while before we get back to whatever the new normal is. Pat, uh, I don't know which box you're looking at, but I have a window open that says chat at the top of it. And there are four or five questions in there one of which is from Alan Ramsar. Hi, Alan. If the coronavirus delays the Russian elections, what does it mean for Putin's future? And the, I Rus the Russian elections? I that, that's, what he's, that's the question. If the <clears throat> coronavirus delays the Russian elections, what does it mean for Putin's future? Um, I don't think it means anything for Putin's future. No, I, I think I, I, they recently, uh, about four or five months ago, had a... Uh, uh, a law passed where he would be able to run for consecutive additional consecutive uh, terms. So uh, if if um, the election was a, a problem in terms in terms of people turning out, I think he would find some way to uh, either extend the election period uh, or yeah. ho hold an election that uh, was was beneficial to his situation. I don't think we're we're going to see. Uh, Vladimir Putin disappear from the scene in Moscow anytime I soon. I agree. Logan Mundy has a question. Have, have looked but haven't seen estimates for possible deaths in developing countries, particularly in Southern Hemisphere. Thoughts? Thanks for doing this. I think we're at the tip of the iceberg and the ramp, you know, the curve is still going to go up in the developing world. And I think that for probably three or four different reasons. Uh, first, the healthcare systems in much of that developing world are woefully inadequate to the task. Uh, in some of these very, very poor countries, maybe they have one hospital that has a half dozen ICU capable facilities. It's uh, gonna be a main problem. So health systems are very weak. Secondly, the population is, density is higher. If in many of the, these countries, you will have a huge slumming, uh, swarming slum outside of the capital city. People you know, would have a very difficult time doing social distancing. The density of that population is gonna make it very hard to do many of the things that we are be able to do here. And finally, the economic input impact is going to be really, really tough because remittances are going to be stopping going back to the country. And for many of these very, very poor countries, the remittances coming back from the developed world are very important. And the exports coming out of those countries are not going to be flowing like they did, so they're not raising the capital. And then the local situation where so many of the population are involved in, in the barter economy or selling fruits and vegetables on the street corner, this is uh, going to be a, a real tough road to hoe. Yeah. Uh, Dick, I'm going to throw a, uh, a slide up on the screen here. We'll see how this goes. Uh, you, can, you can see the relative... Um, uh, disparity of uh, infections in, in Europe at the moment, but there is uh, concern that uh, with the uh, change of seasons, the Southern Hemisphere is going to start to see uh, the pandemic spread uh, even more. So you can see um, a, a distribution and there's a country by country breakdown. Uh, Logan, where you want to look is who.int. That's the World Health Organization uh, website. So they've got a lot of uh, material on there that might be useful for you. Dick, any more questions that uh, I'm not seeing, but you are? Well, uh, Ken Crossley, how do we pay? Anonymous, any thoughts when we turn to normal? Jim Jim's got a question. Chat. Wisconsin election drama highlights upcoming challenges to US democratic processes. How will we vote in the future? Um, well, I, I, I think he's got the wrong web, <laughs> webinar. We're, this is the, the World Affairs Council, but we'll, uh, we'll opine on any subject. Um, I think there's a, there's a strong movement to, uh, to get mail-in ballots in place. Um, the Republican-Democratic breakdown of, uh, 
you know, this is going to be largely a function of the states. The states control the uh, the procedures for voting. Uh, a lot of people recognize that uh, voting in person in November may be problematic because of a, a potential resurgence of the virus. And and frankly, just as long as it's out there, there are going to people be people who, who don't want to go anywhere. Uh, count me count me among those. Um, even when the numbers are low, uh, who's who's going to want to risk being among those who uh, are in that group? So I, I think the answer is it's going to be state by state. Uh, there'll be a strong movement in in the next uh, in the coming months. Uh, I heard that uh, former First Lady Michelle Obama has formed an organization to push through uh, mail-in ballots. So uh, there's there's strong sentiment on the uh, the blue side uh, for mail-in voting. And there's uh, some resistance. Uh, President Trump uh, has said that he believes it's uh, it it lays the ground uh, for corruption. So um, it's a partisan issue that uh, we probably won't get much deeper into than than that. I have one last question for you. Come from Alan Ramser, Pat. What is Pat's candid assessment of the Roosevelt captain's action? Do you agree with McMullen that he was right? Yes. That's the, that's the short answer. I think the, uh, the captain, the commanding officer of a ship uh, has, um, uh, as one of his paramount responsibilities, the, uh, the health and welfare of the ship as, uh, as young officers uh, were taught uh, from the very beginning that uh, you take care of uh, the men and women assigned uh, to you. Uh, you make sure that they have a place to sleep before you find one. You make sure that they have a meal to eat before you get one. And uh, that, that translates as you move up the chain of command to making sure that uh, your people are taken care of. Uh, the captain was correct in that uh, we're not at war and there was no reason that uh, they couldn't stand down the Roosevelt uh, in a place like Guam, get the, the uh, people off the ship, clean the ship, find out who was infected, uh, get back to zero infections on board and get the ship back in action. He was uh, probably open to criticism for the way he communicated that, but I suspect that he may have exhausted uh, other methods to to get the desired uh, action of getting as many people off the ship as he did. But there'll be an investigation, so we'll uh, get some more facts as to what happened. But I think um, the, uh, the the view from, as we call the deck plates, where the sailors are, is that uh, Brett Crozier will probably uh, live on in, in Navy lore as uh, being uh, that captain who who sacrificed his career and his health. Um, he's he's afflicted with the COVID virus, virus. now, uh, but uh, he stood up and and took one for for his crew. Pat, I think it's time for us to sort of get out of here. I'd, I'd like to leave with at least one question before I make a plug for watching tonight and next week. And the question is, who is Daniel Ortega? And where is he? Now, if you can tell me that next week, I'll give you a bonbon or something appropriate. Okay. Are you posing the question to me or, or our uh, no, participants? No, no, everybody out there. Well, I, I'll. Uh, I'll you don't have to answer it now unless you do. Unless you want to. I'll, I'll profess some some inside uh, knowledge when. Oh, okay. When I was uh, on the USS Constellation, another aircraft carrier, I received orders to the Joint Staff at the Pentagon in Washington, and I was told I was going to be the, the Lebanon analyst. So I consumed every piece of information I could have on Lebanon um, to prepare for the job. And when I arrived in 1990, they had just had a transition of government um, in a particular country where that gentleman had been the, the president. I won't, mm. I won't uh, say which country it was, but I was instantly uh, transformed from being the Lebanon analyst to being the analyst of that country, which was moving which, from- Which is between Panama and I mean, Costa Rica and, and uh, Honduras, right? Yes, it's, uh, it's, it's down there. And they uh, have not shut down, and they're and to the consternation of the Costa Ricans and the Hondurans, because the borders are really pretty porous, and people go back and forth all the time. Oh, sure. So yeah. It's it's a mess down there right now. But yeah. Daniel Ortega, the current president, is hasn't been seen in a month, and his wife says he's fine and he doesn't have COVID nineteen. So so we'll uh, we'll give up the answer. Nicaragua. There you go. He was the head of the Sandinistas. The FSLN and third the 19th, time he's been president, I believe. Yeah, he he uh, he's got a lot of uh, staying power. 
Okay, uh, well, Dick, I, I appreciate that uh, little quiz at the end. And um, again, we, uh, we are here every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Uh, we'll be doing this live. We thank the uh, participants. Uh, Dick, they're, they're still there. Uh, no, no defections uh, from, <laughs> from well, our right. list. And we, uh, we look forward to, uh, to doing this again and invite you also to look at uh, Global Nashville with Carl Dean and Global Dialogue, which will be on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. But not tonight, uh, for those who are live with us, uh, it'll be recorded tonight and posted uh, to our YouTube uh, channel and tnwac.org. Last plug, uh, if you're not a member of the World Affairs Council, uh, we appreciate you becoming a member so that uh, we have support to do programs like this and, uh, and the other things we do in education outreach, uh, all in an effort to help the community understand more of what's uh, going on in the world. So Dick, uh, thank you Ambassador Bowers for uh, being uh, the co-host here and, and providing uh, your wisdom and insight. Well, thank you for your leadership and for your script and for all the good stuff you're doing. And thanks to your son, who's over there doing the technical side of things, unseen, right? Okay, we'll tip our hat to Bill Ryan, who's our uh, technical, technical guy. And thanks, right, everybody, so uh, for coming. We'll, uh, we'll see you next week.